Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's installment of Geography of Hope, in which we are taking a trip to the Tongass National Forest, one of my absolute favorite places uh, in Alaska. So I'm very excited. So many of you are joining us this evening. For those of you that I haven't gotten to meet yet through this webinar series, my name is Monica Shear, and I am the Director of Outreach here at Alaska Wilderness League. Uh, I know tonight's event is bringing together so many of us from across the country, which I'm very excited for. And I am joining you from my home office, located here in southeastern Pennsylvania, the traditional territories of the Susquehannock and the Lenape peoples. Um, uh, for those of you that may not remember or did not join us, uh, a mere eight weeks ago, we were still figuring out how we were going to work and engage with all of our activists and donors and supporters in this new virtual centric world that we were finding ourselves in. And um, we did a webinar for Earth Day discussing the Arctic refuge and the climate crisis and how those two really intersect. Um, during that program, we were excited to be joined by so many of you as one of our first webinars and you really expressed an interest in learning more about the Tongass National Forest. And so I am so excited that eight weeks later, we're here tonight uh, to do just that for you, bringing together um, some of my colleagues. I'm gonna be joined tonight by my colleague, Andy Motoro, my colleague, Kaden MacArthur, and of course, a very special guest, photographer and author, Amy Gulick. Um, so before I turn it over to Andy to get us started, um, just a few quick housekeeping bits so that you can get the most out of the presentation tonight. When uh, we are speaking, when a speaker is featured, if you would like to see our face instead of the whole gallery in the upper right-hand corner, you can select speaker view. Uh, if you would like to see the videos of all the participants, you're welcome to use gallery view. We're going to be doing a Q&A uh, with all of our speakers at the end of the program tonight. So at any point during the presentations, if you have a question or something you would like a little more information on, please feel free to type it into the chat um, speaking of the chat box, my colleague Lois will be monitoring it. So if you have any questions or would like some clarification, uh, she will be there to help you out. She will also be sharing some links for additional resources and information. If you are not able to access those during the program, do not worry. We are going to be sending out an email to all of you uh, later this week that will include a recording of this program in case you miss any bit or want to watch it again as well as those links that we share in the chat. So with that being said, and without further ado, I would like to now turn it over to my dear colleague, Andy Motoro, our Alaska director, to kick us off and share with us where we are with regards to the Tongass National Forest. Awesome, thank you, Monica, and hello, everyone. It's always great to see people from around the country joining these conversations. So we're very grateful you took time to join us. 
Um, I'm in Anchorage, Alaska today, um, and I'm on the other end of the bridge that Alaska Wilderness League has created between Alaska and our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. Um, as you all know, as you've been involved in, we work hard to plug people into battles that help protect Alaska's public lands and waters from the coastal plain of the Arctic Refuge down to one of my favorite spots, southeast Alaska and the Tongass National Forest. And make no mistake about it, the Tongass is absolutely incredible because of the diversity of lands and wildlife and opportunities that exist there that Amy's photos are going to show you. So I'm not going to go into those um, because you're going to see it with your own eyes here very soon. Um, but I did want to start out by just talking a little bit about the temperate rainforest that is the Tongass. And um, a temperate rainforest, just definitionally, um, a temperate rainforest differs from what you often think of as a rainforest in that there's no monkeys. We don't have monkeys in the Tongass. Um, but at the same time, it's full of incredible diversity. Um, there's a bunch of different definitions of rainforest, but generally it involves rain and a canopy of very large old trees um, that is only possible without shocking events that dramatically change the landscape. So what you find underneath this canopy is an incredible diversity of plants and wildlife. And you find small trees right next to some of the 800 year old trees that people find in the Tongass. And it's that lack of shocking events that really defines it. I bring this up now because um, for many of you in the West um, and more inland from the coast, you, you might be surrounded by forests where trees are often the same age, right? And there's even some trees that need a catastrophic event Event, like a fire to be able to reproduce. The Tongass is not one of those places. And in fact, it's only until recent, basically the last hundred years that shocking events were introduced to the Tongass National Forest. Um, when clear cut logging, an activity that took place during much of the 19, 1900s um, took place, it left big swaths, hundreds of thousands of acres of places where clear cut trees um, you, you, you know, used to stand. And the forest isn't designed for that. Um, fortunately, a variety of reforms towards the end of um, the, the 1900s, uh, and most recently in 2001, helped to protect a lot of those last stands of old growth forest. Um, unfortunately, one's under attack today, and that's the roadless rule. We produced a video to help explain uh, to Alaskans what is at stake and what is going on. So I'm going to go ahead and play that quick video for you now, and that'll orient you to one of the biggest threats facing the forest before Amy actually takes us there. So I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Those of us who live in Alaska, the concept of backyard is bigger than other places. Sometimes it looks like this, or this, or maybe even this. Whatever your backyard looks like, it's where we go to hunt, fish, and recreate. Now, if you've been following the news lately, the term roadless has been a hot topic. Fundamentally, the roadless debate is about what Alaskans want their backyard to look like. But to fully explain, we need to go back in time a bit. In 2001, the roadless rule was passed to protect nearly 60 million acres of national forest from road building and industrial clear-cut logging. Now, Americans from across the country had deep connections to forest lands and pushed for these protections. But this was especially true in the Tongass National Forest of Southeast Alaska, where communities are completely surrounded by public land. You see, for nearly 50 years, industrial clear-cut logging dominated the region. But when the industry collapsed, Alaskans were left with damaged salmon streams and destroyed landscapes. So in 2001, the roadless rule was a chance for them to decide a new vision for their backyard. And the vast majority wanted to move forward with protections for their thriving salmon fishery, growing tourism industry, and way of life. But not everyone was happy. Industrial logging interests have long hoped to gain access to the ancient old growth trees living deep in the Tongass, some dating over 800 years old. But it would take removing the roadless rule to finally get their cut. Which brings us back to today. After Governor Dunleavy and President Trump met on Air Force One, the Forest Service released a surprising proposal that would strip over 9 million acres of roadless protections from Alaska's national forest. Supporters of this move claim this has nothing to do with logging, and the roadless rule hinders community access, critical utilities, and renewable energy projects. But the roadless rule already allows for projects like these. In fact, since the roadless rule was placed in the Tongass, all 57 requests for projects, ranging from hydroelectric developments 
such community infrastructure needs have been granted by the Forest Service. What the road this rule does prevent is industrial clear-cut logging. This is why the people of Southeast Alaska, tribes in the region, businesses, and visitors have almost unanimously supported roadless protections in the Tongass. They want a stunning backyard that provides billions of dollars to the economy, sustainable jobs, and hunting and fishing opportunities for generations to come. So this is what roadless is all about. Today, industrial logging interests are pushing to remove a decades-old protection, despite continued overwhelming local support. The people of the region have spoken, but it will take voices from across Alaska and beyond to save the roadless rule. Awesome. I hope that video helped place the threat that we are facing today and literally any day, um, though we're hearing it might be a little longer than any day, it might be in the weeks ahead, not, not tomorrow, uh, that the roadless rule redo could propose a full exemption for the Tongass National Forest, which would mean that, you know, up to 9 million acres could potentially be reopened to road building and log logging. Oh, I need to end my video, it looks like. So um, anyways, we wanted to get you up to speed with that threat. The video talked through the region um, interests in protecting an intact Tongass and everything else. My colleague Caden is going to go ahead and uh, give you the good news of how we're fighting back and, and how we're going to beat this threat back in the, in the days ahead. Um, but with no further ado, let's let Amy take us there. So I'm really excited to see Amy's presentation. Uh, this award-winning photographer has taken photos throughout Alaska and her Tongass work is some of my favorites. So uh, thank you for joining us. And as uh, Monica mentioned, we'll be around for questions when this presentation's over. Well, great. Uh, thank you. Um, and thanks. Big thanks to the Alaska Wilderness League um, for having me on. Um, and I'm super excited to be here with all of you um, talking about uh, one of my favorite places in the world, the Tongass National Forest in Alaska. And uh, before I do, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Tulalip, the Snohomish, and the Coast Salish people uh, who have stewarded their traditional homelands here, uh, where I now make uh, my home uh, on Whidbey Island in Washington State. So thank you. Uh, so as a photographer and a writer, I am always on the lookout for interesting stories. And a while back, I, I read an article somewhere that talked about this rather remarkable connection between the salmon and trees in Southeast Alaska. And I have such a bizarre concept to me. It's like, how on earth can there be salmon in trees? And, and so I knew that I had to go there. I had to see it for myself. I had to document it. And uh, then I had to come back and I had to share this uh, incredible story with others. So, uh, so that resulted uh, in my first book, um, Salmon in the Trees, which is what I'll be talking about tonight. And then that book um, led to my second one, uh, which was recently published in the last year, and that one's called The Salmon Way, uh, an Alaska State of Mind. So it, you can probably see a theme with me here. Uh, salmon are kind of a thing. Um, and I hope that they will be with you too, because uh, as you learn more about them, um, they are rather uh, incredible creatures. So uh, let me share my screen here. All right, so where to begin this crazy quest for salmon and trees? Well, before leaving home, uh, a friend gave me some sound advice. He said, remember, Amy, a journey of a thousand miles can end in failure. So that was a real good confidence builder there at the beginning. <laughs> but at the start, all I knew was that I needed to go to Alaska. But Alaska is so mind-boggling in its size, it would be like saying I needed to go to Africa. Alaska is by far our largest state. It's more than twice the size of Texas, our second largest state. And most people tend to think that all of Alaska is this vast frozen expanse with roaming polar bears. And if there are any people there at all, they must live in igloos and travel by dog sled. And while that's a somewhat accurate description of parts of Alaska, where I needed to go is not what comes to mind when we think of our 49th state. I was going to the rainforest of Alaska. Now, I don't know about you, but I always thought that rainforests were in Brazil and Indonesia, warm places near the equator with parrots and monkeys, as Angie said, and, uh, and pythons. 
but those are tropical rainforests, also called jungles. And the rainforest of Alaska is a coastal temperate rainforest. This is one of the rarest ecosystems on the planet. Now, most of Alaska's rainforest is in Southeast Alaska. This is also known as the panhandle of the state or the inside passage for anyone cruising all those sheltered waterways that weave among thousands of islands. Almost 90% of Southeast Alaska is the Tongass National Forest. So anywhere on the map where you see that bright green, uh, that is the Tongass. So this is a place where the forest meets the sea. Clouds slam up against the jagged coast range that separates Alaska and British Columbia on the mainland. And this creates rain, creates lots of rain. So more than 200 inches a year in some places nourish this coastal forest. It's why extra tough rubber boots are an essential part of every Southeast Alaskan wardrobe. Even the babies here are extra tough. So much of the Tongass is spread out over 5,000 islands in what's called the Alexander Archipelago. So in part, because of all these islands, no point on land is far from the sea. And so at times, this line is blurred between where the forest ends and the sea begins. So you'll see things here like bears digging for clams on the beaches, uh, marbled murelets. This is a seabird that nests high in the trees, uh, usually in old growth trees and yet they feed in the ocean. Humpback whales, they cruise right along the forested shorelines here. And animals like ravens and river otters, they carry mussels and crabs uh, from the beaches into the forest. At 17 million acres, this is about the size of the state of West Virginia, the Tongass, it's by far our country's largest national forest. About 70,000 people live in this part of Alaska. But because of all those islands and the rugged mountains on the mainland, the most reliable modes of transportation here are definitely not automobiles, they are boats. Because the streets are made of water. This is uh, Creek Street in Ketchikan. The highways are made of water. This is the Alaska State Ferry. And seaplanes uh, act as taxis. So while I had narrowed my search for salmon in the trees to a relatively small portion of Alaska, it would still take a lifetime to explore all of the Tongass. So where to start and how to get around in this land of islands and jagged peaks? Well, I decided to do something that I really didn't want to do, and that was fly in a small plane with the door off. Uh, this is definitely a potential hazard. I don't recommend anybody trying this. And don't let that smile fool you. It is one of madness and not joy. But the pilot assured me that I would be strapped in with fail-safe buckles and a strong barrier across the opening. Well, one frayed lap belt, one skimpy piece of tape over the buckle, and one worn clothesline across the opening later, I was in the air. Now, I thought if I closed my eyes, it wouldn't be so bad, but that would kind of defeat the whole purpose of doing this. It only took me a few minutes, though, for my fear to somewhat disappear, as the beauty below me took my breath away. Or maybe it was that cinch seatbelt strangling my circulation. So I did this uh, because I wanted to get a big picture of this immense region. And from the air, it's easy to see that the Tongass is a giant mosaic of very different landscapes. And while the Tongass is a national forest, only about 60% is actually forested. The rest is rock, ice, wetlands, and more than 20,000 lakes and ponds and 40,000 miles of streams. So during the last ice age, uh, in um, parts of Southeast Alaska uh, were covered in ice and glaciers have played a large role in sculpting the Tongass into what we see today. So all of the straits and inlets of the inside passage of Southeast are glacial fjords. They're gouged by the Pleistocene glaciers and these bore deep into the bedrock well below sea level. And so when those glaciers receded, salt water then flooded these valleys. So tidewater glaciers, these are where the ice and sea meet. These are found in three areas of Southeast. One of them is Glacier Bay National Park and the other two are in the Tongass National Forest. This isn't typically what we think of when we hear the word national forest. So from the air, you get this big glacial picture of the region, but Nothing will help you understand the forces of glaciers more than actually being on one. And even better, 
is being under one. It is here where the glacier seems most alive, where rock and ice duke it out. And through sheer weight, the ice bears down and the rocks succumb. But long after the glaciers retreat, the rock bounces back. So the land in Southeast Alaska, it's been free, uh, freed from this enormous weight of ice and it's uplifted in a process called isostatic rebound. And in places, the land has risen hundreds of feet and it's still rising today in this geologically active part of the world. So what do glaciers have to do with salmon and trees? Why am I talking about glaciers? Well, when those glaciers receded, some new occupants then moved in. Things like seeds, spores, bugs, shrubs, birds, beavers, trees, deer, wolves, fish, bears, and people. And the forest was born. And it is in the forest where I will find trees and perhaps salmon in the trees. And besides, I won't have to be up in that airplane and I can be safely back on the ground. Although safe is a relative term here. One of the world's highest densities of brown bears, also called grizzly bears, lives here, as well as the highest density of black bears in the world. And the forests are quite thick. So it's not like you can see a bear coming a mile away. Sometimes you can't even see a bear coming a few footsteps away. So surely if I stayed back out on the water, I'd be okay, right? Well, bears can swim. And the sea is loaded with large creatures with big teeth as well. And at certain times of the year, it's hard to look anywhere on or under the water and not see something stunning. Dolls porpoises clocked at speeds of 30 knots may be the fastest of all the small cetaceans. When I plunged into the icy waters here, I was astounded at all of the colorful life, uh, particularly the tiny creatures like sea anemones, and uh, these are known as nudibranchs. But it was the big guys, these stellar sea lions that would buzz me uh, on more than one occasion. And you have no idea just how fast, how big and how powerful they are until you find yourself face to face with one or 10 because they seem to roam around in large gangs. For sheer size though, nothing beats the humpback whale. Humpbacks migrate to this area every spring traveling thousands of miles from their birthing grounds in places like Hawaii to dine on the smorgasbord of herring and small shrimp called krill. Now, sometimes the whales employ a technique called bubble net feeding, and this is where they spiral upward, blowing a curtain of bubbles that confuses and corrals the prey. They then burst through the surface, scooping up the lassoed rewards. And there's nothing quite as thrilling as being in the middle of a pod of humpback whales. But if you're in a hurry to get somewhere, it can be a little annoying because they will disrupt your schedule. And while they sucked hours and days away from my search for salmon and trees, I have to admit that they were a very welcome distraction. So do I travel by land or by sea? Well, both. It's how the native people live for thousands of years. And today, people's lives here are very much tied to both. The Tongass is traditionally Clinkett Indian territory and in more recent times, uh, home to some Haida and Simshin people as well. Now, most native peoples of the area traditionally located their villages just above high tide line. The tidal exchanges in this part of the world are huge, more than 20 feet in places, with clams, seaweed, gumbu chitons, and other food sources right out their front door. The native folks have a saying that very much holds true today. When the tide is out, the table is set. Since time immemorial, the sea has been an important food source for the first peoples of the Tongass, very much continues to be so today. Uh, th these are two young men in the village of Cake, uh, filleting a halibut that then gets distributed uh, to the community and uh, other community members in Cake. Um, they are in the background there, um, uh, cutting and uh, packaging up smoked salmon and in the foreground that is smoked seal meat and braided seal uh, intestines. So in addition to the sea, the forest is very important too for things like berries and medicinal plants uh, and trees for totem poles, uh, longhouses, and weaving materials. And it's no surprise that the artworks, dances, and oral histories of the native folks in the Tongass region are rich with stories of people and creatures like salmon, bears, and whales transforming into one another. 
Clans like killer whale, frog, and wolf speak to the importance of both land and sea. So in the native cultures here, the family lines follow the mother and people belong to one of two major groups, uh, also known as moieties. So in this part of the world, you are either eagle or you are raven. So I had the honor of spending time with many native people who allowed me a glimpse into their culture. In the village of Kloak on Prince of Wales Island, I spent time in John Rowan Jr.'s carving shed. John is Klinka Eagle of the Shankwaidi Wolf Clan. He's also a United States Marine and a native arts teacher, instructing students in things like carving, language, oral history, and dancing. And in addition to teaching the next generation of kids, John is overseeing the carving of the third generation of totem poles in his village. 21 poles in all, with at least 250 hours going into each one. And it, it took him over, I think, 12, 13 years to accomplish this. Carving next to John, this is 15-year-old Noelle Demert. She's Klinka Eagle of the Kogwan Pond clan, and she's the lead carver on this totem pole to honor a Haida man who carved and gifted a canoe to the people of her village. And John told me that not too long ago, uh, the native people were just barely hanging on to their culture uh, by their fingernails. No one was carving, no one was making the beautiful button blanket robes um, or weaving uh, hats. Um, but today and in the last several decades, there's been quite a strong resurgence and John hopes that the youth uh, grab hold and run with it. I was very honored to attend uh, the pole raising ceremony for the pole that Noel carved under John's watchful eye. This is an occasion of great celebration where the people dress in their clan regalia and perform uh, traditional dances and songs. And no celebration like this would be complete without a feast, including salmon. This is one of the most important food sources for the native cultures and a very uh, important part of the economy for many people in uh, Southeast Alaska. So yeah, salmon in trees, um, the focus of my quest. You can see how easy it is to get distracted here. It's like wherever you look, there's just incredible things. But where there are salmon fishermen, um, I'm hoping that there, there might be salmon. So I hook up with Carl Jordan. He's a fourth generation Alaskan salmon fisherman out of Sitka on Baranoff Island. And Carl tells me he's proud to catch what he considers the best food in the world. At 28 years old, he's more in tune with his connection to the natural world than people twice his age. His commute aboard his 38-foot trolling boat takes him past forested islands and breaching whales. He looks for seabirds feeding on herring. This is a good sign that salmon may be present. Weather, tides, and water temperatures guide his decisions, and he knows he's part of an intricate web. And Carl's typical of many fishermen in the Tongass region, and I think that most of us are surprised to learn that it's small mom and pop operators like him that are delivering the best food in the world to our grocery stores and our restaurants. So this is Carl's young family and they double as his crew. So everybody here is swabbing the decks. So he tells me that he's very thankful for the salmon because not only do they help him provide for his family, but they do all of us who eat them uh, an awesome service by nourishing our bodies. And then he says something that makes my head spin. He says that when the salmon swim into the forest, they nourish the trees too. Could this be salmon in the trees? I promptly thank him, jump off the boat, and I head back to land. So I needed to find salmon in the forest, and I asked a wildlife biologist where to go. And he said, well, any stream. And given that I didn't have an entire lifetime to explore the 40,000 miles of streams in the Tongass, I asked if he could be a little bit more specific, and he repeated as if I were a stubborn child who was pestering him with a silly, curious question. And he streamed. Well, he was pretty much right. So when you go looking for salmon in streams, you will almost certainly see bears as well, whether you want to or not. On Admiralty Island, it would be highly unusual not to see bears, and that's where I was headed. So the Clinket people call this island Kutsnuwu. And this translates into Fortress of the Bears. It's an appropriate name as Admiralty has one of the highest densities of brown bears in the world, an average of nearly one bear per square mile. So islands worldwide, you think of the Galapagos or Hawaii, 
These are living laboratories for studying the effects that islands have on the distribution of animals and plants. And the islands here in the Tongass uh, are no exception. So the mix of wildlife on any island, it's a combination of things like time, chance, mobility, predation, and resistance to drowning. So in the Tongass, if you don't want to see brown bears, then there are three islands that you should not visit. Admiralty, Baranoff, and Chichagov. These are known as the ABC islands. Now, there are no black bears on these islands, on these three, although black bears are plentiful on other islands, and both brown and black bears live on the mainland. As scientists studying the brown bears on the ABC islands, they theorize that they're descendants of a long isolated group, and they're more closely related to polar bears, believe it or not, than they are to the brown bears back on the mainland. And this research supports the idea that there were pockets of land called refugia that were not entirely covered by ice during the last ice age. Now, it's fascinating to contemplate the past, but the second that you step foot on Admiralty Island, all that really matters is the present. There's nothing like being in a place known as the Fortress of the Bears to make you acutely aware of the here and now. You're in someone else's home, someone a lot bigger and stronger than you, and it would be nice to return to your own home at some point. So you're on your very best behavior. It's as if Miss Manners or the Queen of England herself greeted you at the shores of the island. You announce yourself, you're considerate, you're super clean with your food, and you give your host, particularly the lady of the house and her offspring, plenty of personal space. If you do all of these things, you'll likely have a pleasant visit perhaps extraordinary. So the mouth of Pat Creek on Admiralty Island, this is a beautiful example of a rich estuary. This is a place where freshwater streams empty into protected bays of the coastline. An estuary is in a constant state of flux as the tides ebb and flow. Fine sediments are pushed into the intertidal area and they support the growth of salt tolerant plants. And biologically, estuaries are highly productive areas supporting a rich mix of terrestrial and marine life. So nutritious sedges, like you see here, uh, grow in estuaries and they nourish many different animals. I had no idea just how much salad bears will eat until I watched them grazing on sedges day after day. And when I visited Admiralty Island in early August, salmon were leaving the ocean and entering the estuary. And sure enough, there were plenty of bears waiting for them. Now, there's nothing like watching bears in their home. And at Pat Creek, there are no fences or guard dogs keeping watch over us. The only thing that separates us here is respect. And that's respect on our part. So when you arrive on Admiralty Island um, uh, near Pat Creek uh, by boat or float plane, because it's the only way to get there, uh, you arrive on the shore there, um, uh, towards the beginning of that little spit that's kind of sticking out. And then you walk to the end of that spit and you can kind of see that little cleared area uh, there, a little rectangle, um, that's where you sit. And um, the salmon are coming in and uh, the bears are coming in to eat the salmon. So that's the on, on the ground of that little viewing area that I just showed you uh, from the air. And again, there's nothing here separating us from the bears. But it seemed like for the most part, as long as we stayed in our space and our behavior was predictable to the bears, uh, the bears went about their day. And, but every now and then, a younger bear would maybe get chased into our space by a dominant bear. Or I think sometimes the bears just get curious as to what we are and you know, what we're doing. And these are the encounters that you don't ever forget. And you don't ever forget who is in charge. So one evening, our commute back to our camp was delayed for about an hour until this bear wandered away from our vehicle. So I'm watching the bears here because the salmon are here. But why are the salmon here? Well, salmon are remarkable creatures. They're born in freshwater streams and rivers. They head out to the oceans to mature. And then they return to their birth streams as adults to spawn the next generation. Now think about that for a minute. The salmon are out in the ocean, thousands of miles from where they were born, and somehow at just the right time, they find their way back to the very place where they started their lives. That has got to be one of the greatest feats of nature.
Now the tonga supports all five species of Pacific salmon and every summer and fall, millions of wild salmon fill the nearly 5,000 spawning streams in the Tongas. This is the time of year when the whole place comes alive. Where there's a concentration of food, the crowds show up, not unlike a Friday night, all you can eat buffet. So the great numbers of salmon help to explain why the Tongass region supports the world's highest nesting density of bald eagles, and why there are 80 bears here for every one bear found inland far from salmon stream. And to watch this feeding frenzy has got to be one of the greatest spectacles on our planet. More than 50 species, at least, have been documented feeding on salmon in Alaska. Among them, black bears, brown bears, gulls, uh, ravens, crows, river otters, uh, bald eagles, uh, mink, seals, uh, sea lions, uh, orcas, also known as killer whales, and people. I know, I eagerly await the salmon's return. Even more astounding though, is that enough salmon dodge this deadly obstacle course of the beaks and jaws of animals, as well as the nets and hooks of people to sustain their populations year after year. And they've been doing this for thousands and thousands of years. Now, during salmon time, the competition for food can be quite fierce. It's every bird, beast, and fisherman for him or herself. And while the larger animals usually have first dibs on salmon, there are other ways to get a meal. Uh, so the bald eagle here in the center uh, has a part of a salmon carcass in its talon. And the bald eagle there on the left is uh, perhaps thinking of stealing it. And so while these two are having a little quarrel, uh, keep an eye on Raven there on the right. So this is typical uh, bald eagle behavior. He's standing on his food, he's guarding it, he's vocalizing to the other eagle, pretty much saying, you know, stay away from my food. So while they're quibbling back and forth, uh, what do you think Raven's going to do? Yeah, it uh, doesn't take long of uh, uh, spending a little bit of time uh, really observing ravens to understand why the native people in the region refer to raven as the trickster. So while there's a lot of action going on at the mouths of these salmon streams and in the estuaries, I noticed that many salmon make it past this gateway between ocean and land, and they keep swimming upstream into the forest. So you can see there um, out in the, uh, kind of in the background of the image there, that's the intertidal area, that's the estuary. Um, so the salmon have kind of woven their way through that, and they found the main channel there in the foreground uh, of this particular stream. And so that whole dark mob there, that is all salmon. And this is not unusual. Thousands and thousands of streams in the Tongas uh, in the summer all look like this, uh, pretty remarkable. So the salmon have found this main channel of the stream and they continue. They're, they're heading up uh, into the forest. And so I decide to follow them and find out where they're going. And so to do this, uh, I had to Wrangle Island where I meet up with Brenda Schwartz Yeager. Brenda is a fourth generation Alaskan and her ancestors worked as bounty hunters, trappers, and big game guides. And Brenda tells me that she's the first generation in her family to be able to bring people to the Tongas and not take anything other than photographs. Brenda says that in society today, you know, we're all so used to pushing a button and controlling our scenery, our temperature, and, and even our sound. But in a real wilderness, she says, we quickly realize that we're not in control. And it's humbling. And she thinks it's good for us to be humble. And probably no other place that Brenda goes that allows people to experience uh, wild Alaska and be rather humbled uh, is a place called Annan Creek. So off we go, headed for the mainland, uh, zooming over the water in her boat, which she has named the Wild Side. So we moor the boat at the mouth of the creek and we enter the forest on foot. So it's mid-August and the place is thrumming with life as gobs of salmon are making their way upstream. So the harpy screams of ravens are emanating from the forest. Uh, bald eagles are swooped from treetop to rock top, eyeballing the feast before them. Hordes of Bonaparte gulls uh, descend upon the stream and they're scooping up the salmon eggs. And about a mile into the forest, the stream is pinched by a series of waterfalls and the salmon are jammed up. 
And it is here where the bears gather for this all-you-can-eat buffet. Now, black bears are pretty much the star attraction um, at Annan Creek, but since Annan is on the mainland and not one of the islands, brown bears occasionally show up too. So the bears are wary of one another, but they tolerate each other's presence because the food is so plentiful here. But there's definitely a hierarchy, and the bigger the bear, the better the fishing spot. And I have to say that these are some of the healthiest bears I've ever seen. The place is literally crawling with bears, and there's so much going on that I have no idea where to point my camera. So I try to focus on the bears fishing uh, when another bear jumps onto the viewing platform. This interrupts my concentration just a little bit, forces me to move back. Uh, still another bear passes just a few feet uh, behind me, and yet another bear hangs above me. So all of this is going around, you know, going on, you know, in front of you, behind you, above you, and I, I really kind of start wondering, you know, who's watching whom? Am I watching the bears or are they watching me? It's a little bit of both. But at some point, I try to ignore the bears a little bit and focus on the salmon. Fin to fin, tail to tail, they sway against the current as one giant mob. I forget that they're individual fish until one springs from the crowd, hurling itself against this foaming wall of water. And then another, and another. And this goes on for hours, days, weeks. But for the salmon, every minute is precious as their time is coming to an end. They've stopped eating. They're in their final act, spawning, and they won't stop pushing upstream until they die. It's a testament to the power of their biological clock. Passing on their genes is their mission in life, and once accomplished, they pay for it with their lives. After spawning, they die. That is the life cycle of Pacific salmon. So I always like to say that if you're a salmon, there's no such thing as safe sex. You spawn, you die. So stinking rotten salmon carcasses are everywhere. And I am now surrounded by death, but in death, there is life. And as I contemplate the life cycle of these incredible fish, a bear zooms up a tree with a salmon in its mouth. Could this be salmon in the tree? Well, technically, this is salmon up a tree. So how the sec heck do sa salmon get in the trees? Well, away from the creek, I spot a fresh salmon with a bite taken out of it, dragged and dropped into the forest. And suddenly, the thing I've been searching for was staring me in the face and it all made perfect sense. The salmon, bears, trees, soil, bugs, roots, berries, birds, and the bees, it was all right here in this glorious cycle of life. One of the greatest shows on earth and one that plays out all over the Tongass every year. So here's the deal. Scientists have found high concentrations of a nitrogen variant in trees near salmon streams. This variant, it's called nitrogen-15, and it comes from the ocean. So how did it find its way from the sea into the forest? Well, it swam there, in the bodies of salmon loaded with marine nutrients from their time at sea. But how exactly then does it get into the trees? Well, bears have a lot to do with this. Bears don't particularly like being around other bears, so when they catch a fish, they'll often carry it away from the stream and into the woods. And it turns out that bears can move a lot of salmon into the forest. Researchers say that one bear can carry 40 fish from a stream in just eight hours. Now, toward the end of a good salmon season, the bears can afford to be picky and they're usually targeting the richest parts of the fish and they leave the rest behind. Other animals then scavenge on these carcasses and this spreads the nutrients farther throughout the forest. Well, guess what happens? All of this rich fish fertilizer decomposes into the soil and the trees and other vegetation then absorb it through their roots. Scientists have actually been able to trace nitrogen-15 in trees near salmon streams that links directly back to the fish. And that is how salmon end up in the trees. Now, not to be outdone, the trees return the favor by nurturing the salmon. Trees shade the spawning streams. This keeps water temperatures cool for the developing fish eggs. The tree's roots help stabilize the stream banks, and this prevents erosion from fouling the clean water and gravel beds the salmon need to lay their eggs. And fallen trees create protective pools and provide food for insects for the young salmon. So in parts of the Tongass, 
trees help grow salmon and salmon help grow trees. So I always like to think that salmon are part ocean and they are part forest. Now, when you understand this connection, this remarkable connection between salmon and trees, you quickly start to see other connections. Bald eagles fueled by salmon will soar greater distances to find food during the lean winter months. Female bears padded with fat reserves will give birth in their dens and nurse their tiny cubs with salmon enriched milk. The forest fertilized with supercharged soil from decayed fish will sprout new growth come spring. And what about the salmon? Well, as winter arrives, the last of the adult fish are spawned out and their nutrient packed bodies pick clean. But they didn't die in vain. Swaddled in the streams and incubated by the forest, their fertilized eggs will soon hatch the next generation, ensuring that the cycle of life is a circle, always flowing, never broken. So in the Tongass, what goes around comes around. And that goes for us too. Salmon help us understand that we also need healthy forests and oceans for the gifts of clean water, air, food, and and now climate regulation. And what we do to the forest can affect the oceans and what we do to the ocean can affect the forest. So what's the threat to the Tongass? Well, it's helpful to back up a little bit and, and know some history. So when Russians and Europeans uh, first arrived on these forested shores in the 1700s, they saw a land of superabundance and they started taking things in large quantities. They started taking things like gold, sea otter furs, uh, whale oil, and salmon. Now, we were a little slow to start taking timber here in great quantities, but that all changed after World War II. Industrial scale logging began in earnest, and some of the great forests of the Tongass began to fall. Thousands of miles of logging roads and clear cuts have degraded parts of the Tongass, impacting some salmon streams and the people and wildlife who rely on them. Now keep in mind that again, that as big as that Tongass is, 17 million acres, 40% is not forested at all. It's rock, ice, and wetlands. Only 30% of the Tongass contains what are called productive old growth forests with any kind of commercial timber value. And less than 3% of the entire Tongass consists of these. These are called big tree productive old growth forests. These are among the areas most valuable to wildlife, including salmon, and the people who rely on them. And while these forests are best known for their centuries old giants, they are in fact uh, what ecologists call multi-aged or ageless forests. And I'll explain what I mean by this. So when a giant falls, like this one did here, it snapped off probably in a windstorm, um, this creates a gap in the canopy and this allows light to reach the forest floor and this stimulates uh, new growth. Saplings and, and shrubs then sprout and clamor for the sky. All ages and sizes of trees over time uh, create a multi-storied canopy. And in a forest like this, uh, in depth, there is life. A fallen tree becomes what's called a nurse log and its decay provides nutrients uh, for new trees that then grow on top of it. Many decades later, we can see where that nurse log once was, now called a ghost log, that nourished this tree that started its life on top of it. A standing dead snag provides homes and lookout spots for all kinds of critters, and the feast that the forest provides nourishes many uh, different animals. Uh, this is a plant called Devil's Club, and it's large clumps of berries. It's a very important food source for bears, and Devil's Club is one of the most important medicinal plants uh, to the native people. A bunchberry, this is a critical food source for the Sitka black-tailed deer, particularly in the winter months. And the deer, in turn, is an important food source for wolves, bears, and many local people. So what happens after all the trees are removed from one of these forests? Well, there is a lot of new growth at first, but it doesn't last long. In a relatively short amount of time, just a few decades or so, the even aged trees that grow up create a closed canopy and they shade out any understory plants. This uh, particular forest was clear cut about 70 years ago and biologically it's a desert. There's, you know, there's no food here for wildlife, uh, particularly deer. And there are many parts of the Tongass that now look like this. And scientists have determined that the forest will persist in this state for several centuries before it begins to develop the complex structural characteristics 
of a productive old growth forest again. So while trees are renewable, uh, an old growth forest in this part of the world is not, not in any kind of human time frame. So of North America's original coastal temperate rainforest, which once extended intact all the way from South Central Alaska down to Northern California, 44% has been affected by urban development, logging, or farming. And most of this has taken place from Vancouver, Vancouver Island in British Columbia south. So anywhere we see in red has been developed in some way. And those original forests uh, are pretty much uh, now gone. Uh, but here's the good news. And it's the whole reason I pursued telling the story of this incredible place. So the Tongass is located here. Uh, in that bright green area. And remarkably, enough critical areas are still intact, holding the ecological integrity of this whole place together. All of the species that existed at the time of European settlement are still here. Nothing is missing. Brown bears, wiped out in most of the lower 48 states, live here in some of the highest densities in the world, in part due to all of those healthy wild salmon runs which in turn support other species as well as a viable commercial fishing industry that's been certified as one of the world's best examples of a sustainable fishery. Humpback whales find enough to eat to fuel their long migrations. The native people still live where their ancestors have since time immemorial. All the local people here enjoy a very special way of life. And visitors come here because there is no other place like it on the planet. And when it comes time and we can all travel again, I highly recommend um, that you do visit the Tongass. It is one of probably the most accessible wild places uh, in our country. Um, you can stay in a comfortable hotel and uh, 20 minutes by float plane, you can be on Admiralty Island, you know, seeing one of the highest densities of brown bears in the world. It's pretty remarkable uh, that way. Now, some of the most uh, biologically critical areas of the Tongass are not protected. This is what Andy was uh, talking about when he was talking about this roadless rule um, uh, being under threat. And the threats to these areas that aren't protected include things like uh, you know, continued logging, uh, mining, uh, industrial scale, uh, tourism, uh, energy development of you know, some kind, uh, climate change. Um, and really, you know, who knows what else down the road? I'm sure things that we're not even thinking about today. Yet despite all of these threats, I have hope. I think that we can get it right in the Tonga simply because there's still time to do so. And we know it's the, it's the right thing to do. We're not trying to bring things back from the dead here. We're just trying to maintain what still exists. And we have an uh, unprecedented opportunity to ensure that the most biologically rich areas uh, actually stay that way. So let us learn from the lessons that salmon in the trees teach us, that everything is connected, that this most magnificent of rainforest thrives because all of its pieces still exist, and that we are a part of it all too. Now globally, coastal temperate rainforests are rare, covering just one thousandth of the Earth's land surface. The Tongass contains a third of the world's old growth temperate rainforest and the largest reserves of intact old growth forests left in our country. And it's ranked among the top 10 national forests in the United States for its ability to store carbon and regulate global climate. So it's not just important for the people who live there, uh, it's important for all of us. And as you can see, we've been given a great gift. And with that, comes a great responsibility. The Tongass is public land. It is entrusted to all of us. We all have a say, whether we live in Alaska, Washington, Illinois, or Florida, it belongs to all of us. And it's my greatest hope that the Tongass will always be a place where there are salmon in the trees. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Amy, um, for that. I really did feel, it took me a minute because I was like, oh, I'm back <laughs> uh, in such a magnificent place. Um, and I know seeing all of the comments about how beautiful it was in your photography, um, just really special. And looking forward to answering some of those questions. So I'll just remind folks, if you had any questions,
for us, Amy, or any of the other speakers, please feel free to type them in the chat. And now, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Kaden, who's going to share a little bit about how we are working to make sure that the Tongass remains a place uh, where the ecosystem thrives. Hi, everyone. My name is Caden. I work on the legislative team for the League here in Washington, D.C., uh, where we work to influence policy to protect places like the Tongass. <laughs> I want to say thanks to Amy for taking us through the Tongass just barely. That was incredible. Uh, and now that you've been filled in on the threats to the Tongass, particularly the repeal of the roadless rule, I'm going to tell you more about what we're doing at the League in response to these threats. Um, as we mentioned, the Trump administration is in the process of finalizing an Alaska exemption to the roadless rule. Uh, if this happens, we will be working with our lawyers to evaluate options in response to those actions. Uh, we are also preparing for a potential presidential transition. Uh, and if that lay of the land improves, undoing the attacks on the roadless rule will be one of our main goals in 2021. Uh, but we aren't just leaving it at that. We are also working with Congress for a long-term solution to the Tongass. Uh, at the beginning of the 116th Congress, the Roadless Area Conservation Act was introduced in both the House and Senate uh, by Representative Gallego and Senator Cantwell, who are both powerful champs for Alaska and public lands. Uh, this legislation would codify the roadless rule, um, which for 20 years has protected over 60 million acres of pristine national forest land across the country, um, and as we mentioned, 9 million acres in the Tongass. And the Trump administration is in the process right now of attempting to exempt the entire state of Alaska from the roadless rule. And this would hand millions of acres to the timber industry. But by codifying the roadless rule, these sorts of actions uh, from the Trump administration would no longer be a threat to the Tongass. Uh, once codified, unlike administrative actions, uh, this law could only be undone by an act of Congress. Uh, and the roadless rule was the most commented on public process in American history. Um, with over one and a half million comments and 95% in favor of the rule, uh, which is why we are excited about this legislation that has support from so many of the American people. Um, and in the House of Representatives, uh, this bill has nearly 100 co-sponsors, and in the Senate, it has uh, about 20 co-sponsors. Um, so that's roughly one-fourth of the House and one-fifth of the Senate um, on record supporting this bill. Uh, and this legislation really builds public momentum because of supporters like all of you, um, because of the actions you take, your interest, and your passion for Wild Alaska. Uh, it's your energy and involvement that really propel this type of action across the finish line, whether it's actions like reaching out to your member of Congress or commenting on actions from the administration. Um, and the Roadless Area Conservation Act is one of several ways we are working to protect the Tongass. Uh, we've also been working through Congress's budget process to end uh, subsidies that prop up logging in the Tongass. The federal government spends about $20 million a year subsidizing logging in the Tongass. And last year, in part due to our efforts, the House of Representatives voted to end those subsidies. Um, and the state of the world with COVID currently has really changed how lobbying and federal advocacy works. But that doesn't mean that our work has stopped. Um, while in-person meetings may no longer be the norm at the moment, uh, here at the League, we're already looking into planning ways to lobby virtually and provide constituents the opportunity to talk with their uh, members of Congress and their staff. Um, and we're hoping to secure even more co-sponsors for the Roadless Area Conservation Act to show further support from Congress. Um, some of this is a first for us, but we're excited at the opportunities this could provide for the future. Thank you so much, Kaden. And yeah, I am extremely excited as well um, to help build and enable all of you who have seen this wonderful place and many of you who I'm already have been well connected to it um, and passionate about it to speak up and help us uh, continue its protections. And with that, I will share my screen very quickly and turn it over to Ariel, who will talk a minute more about what you can do to get involved. Thanks, Monica. So, hi, I'm Ariel Baker. I'm the annual giving manager here at Alaska Wilderness League and one of the members of the development team. So as Caden, Andy, and Amy have shared some of the extremely important reasons for why protecting the Tongass National Forest is so important both for animals like salmon, 
as well as for people, I wanted to just take a minute to explain how you can get involved with Alaska Wilderness League and our efforts to conserve these special places. So the first is to become a member. I actually see so many members online now, including members of our board. So welcome to you all. For those of you who are not members, I encourage you to become a member by making a donation today. Uh, and for those of you who are already members, I hope you'll consider making an additional donation to support educational efforts like these. Donations are vital to make these and all of our events possible, so I hope you'll join us today. The link to donate is there on the slide, and Lois can also put it in the chat, and we will also include it in the follow-up email. So additionally, um, we're calling on you today to take action, as activism is also so important in supporting LEAP's efforts which is why we are consistently calling on our members to take actions. So as Caden just explained, our legislative team is currently working on codifying the roadless rule. So we are calling on you to contact your legislator to co-sponsor the Roadless Area Conservation Act. And you can just follow that link in order to take that action. And finally, one more way to engage with the league is to follow us on social media. So we have included the handles for our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram there. Um, and all of those include actions that we're currently promoting, as well as opportunities to have your donations matched, as well as beautiful pictures of the places that you care so much about. I know that I personally really love following us on Instagram because then I get to see photos of the amazing places that our team is working so hard to protect. So we hope that you will follow us today. And with that, I just wanted to take a minute to thank Amy, who is a long-term friend and member of the league. We'll take questions. Thank you, Ariel. And yeah, I would like to also echo um, Ariel in thanking everyone who is on today that has joined us for these webinars and has supported the league um, in many different facets. Uh, the turnout and the support really just has been overwhelming and we couldn't do this work uh, without all of you. And with that, I would like to jump into some questions that we got. So thank you and feel free if you have um, others. Uh, one, Amy, I will start with you, <laughs> is um, if you could talk a little bit about or just share how long the process was from your kind of initial um, learning of this ecosystem of the salmon and the trees and then through your adventure to, to find them. Uh, the whole project from like when I left my home for the first time and then when I actually held the book in my hands was three years and um, that was fast. <laughs> I, I realized I, I could have spent, it could have spent a lifetime, you know, exploring that place. But um, I really wanted to, um, again, get, get that book uh, in the hands of decision makers, you know, get it into the hands of the Alaska Wilderness League, then you can get it in the hands of decision makers, which you've done a spectacular job of. Um, again, it's just such a, an amazing place and, and that whole salmon in the trees connection is so remarkable. I think that um, it's kind of my goal that, to help people understand that one connection and if they could just understand that one connection that they would understand the entire ecosystem of the Tongas and, and, and how everything is connected and that all of those pieces are still there. Um, but again, I've been back many times and it's never, no, no, no salmon stream is ever the same. Um, it's just, it, it, it's like, you know, going there for the first time every time I go. So it's, uh, yeah, it's remarkable. Um, wonderful. And then speaking of, you know, this was a, a you know, the obvious theme was the interconnectedness um, and the ecosystem. I also love that you 
incorporate and shared how people play a role throughout that. Um, there was a question about fungus and the role that it has in Tongass and knowing a little bit and having spent a little bit of time bouncing around on some bogs in the Tongass. Um, yeah, it is prolific. So I didn't know if you have anything you wanted to share about <laughs> some fungus and their role in this whole system. Yeah, I, I saw that. I was perusing the chat and I saw that question like, ah, somebody, <laughs> someone must be a scientist. <laughs> um, you know, when we think of fungus, we, we tend to think of, you know, the, the above ground, you know, visible you know, mushrooms, you know, whatever species they may be. Um, underneath the ground, there's this incredible network of uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And I don't, I, that's about <laughs> as deep as I can get into it without probably putting my foot in my mouth and making a lot of mistakes here. But the mycorrhizal fungi is, um, it's just this incredible network all throughout uh, the forest. It's often referred to as the wood wide web instead of the world wide web. Um, and without that fungi, the salmon, uh, those salmon nutrients would not be able to be absorbed into the roots of trees. I scientifically, I can't explain the process, but if the fungi weren't there, um, it wouldn't happen. And so, yeah, they're a, a very important part of this whole salmon in the trees connection. You know, I, I very much simplified, you know, how it is that salmon get into the trees. It's much more complex. Um, but you know, we, I don't want to lose people either by going into <laughs> the, the weeds or the fungi in this case, but yeah, crucial part. Absolutely. Uh, Andy, I have um, a little bit for you. There, I know you saw there was a question regarding the support of Alaskans for the, the, the roadless conservation. You shared a little bit. I wanted to give you an opportunity to um, expound on what was kind of highlighted in the add a little bit and then um, while, while I have you, if you could also talk about any um, logging or situ the logging situation as it currently stands in the region. Awesome. Well, Southeast Alaska has really moved on from its logging past. And you see that in the billion dollar industries that are tourism and fisheries. Um, and so part of that, when the roadless rule revision has been going on, um, there were 18 hearings throughout Southeast Alaska asking local communities what they wanted. And in many communities like Sitka, 100% of people wanted to keep the roadless rule. Um, we actually, through our partners, with our partners, Southeast Alaska Conservation Council, a great group named SEAC, uh, they actually FOIA'd um, the Forest Service to get the record of the public comment. Um, and their great work revealed that 96% of total comments were in support of no action for the roadless rule and less than 1% of total comments uh, supported a full exemption of the roadless rule for the Tongass. So that shows you the nationwide comment. Um, in the 196 people at subsistence hearings in Southeast Alaska, only 10 out of 196 people uh, were in support of a full exemption for the roadless rule. The rest of the testimony, a vast majority as they put it, um, said that they want to keep it because it protects traditions, access to resources, sustainable economy, and everything else for the region. So uh, we have big polling data as well in Alaska and our partners at Trout Unlimited did one that I put in the chat um, that shows a majority of Alaskans don't want to get rid of the roadless rule and how it protects Alaska, um, places like the Tongass. And this is all in under the threat um, of logging getting jump started. And it's a credible threat. The Trump administration worked to try to open up Prince of Wales Island um, more for logging. And uh, we actually succeeded with our lawyers in court at stopping that. Um, again, that's a blog post that I put into the chat. Um, but that was because of the process by which they were doing the planning. It would have been the biggest timber sale in recent decades in the Tongass on lands not protected by the roadless rule. So it just shows that there is still a credible threat, but the region's really moving past it. And our work is to keep that transition going so we can hand the place off to a future generation and they can have the same opportunities we do. Awesome. Thank you. And speaking of opportunities, there have been a few questions about getting the opportunity to see this place uh, in person and particularly the best time of year to visit and the best time to see these magnificent salmon runs. Oh yeah. Um... <laughs> And it depends on, on, on the salmon system uh, that you're going to see. But in general, I'd say late July, kind of when the salmon are coming in, uh, they're coming into their freshwater streams. August uh, in Southeast is pretty much known as salmon time. 
um, September, they're still coming in. Um, but I will say as the summer goes on, typically in Southeast, the weather tends to get worse and deteriorate. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I'd, I'd go, yeah, kind of that end of July, probably any, any bit of August. And also it's a rainforest, so you are going to get wet. <laughs> Um, <laughs> kind of no matter when you go, right? Um, but it's still relatively warm in those months. Um, but yeah, I, again, it is, it's magnificent. It is incredibly accessible. And this is really rare, you know, to, to go to an area and see, you know, nature like it's been for thousands and thousands of years. Typically, you know, you're going to be camping or, you know, backpacking or, you know, doing something strenuous. And you can do all that in the Tongass. You can definitely get you know, away and into wilderness areas, but you don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, you can you can go and again be pretty comfortable in a hotel and still see, uh, you know, this forest at its very best. I would say if you took a trip to the Tongass and you didn't have any rain, you would be missing out. Whenever I think, I just think <laughs> drippy. It's a drippy place, and that's what makes it special. So, <laughs> yeah, pack pack your raincoat um, and enjoy it. There were a few questions about some of the drawings that you had in your presentation specifically. Did you do them or where folks could get them possibly? Uh, uh, oh yes, yes, I, I should have mentioned that. Great question. Um, all of those illustrations are by Ray Troll, um, very beloved and well-known Southeast Alaskan artist. He lives in Ketchikan. Um, trollart.com I believe is his website, but if you Google Ray Troll, T-R-O-L-L, -L, um, he'll pop up. That incredible sense of humor, a wonderful artist, and yeah, sells a million t-shirts <laughs> with this great art on it. So yeah, th thank you for asking that. Yeah, they, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, and that's very true for those depictions to really encapture everything that the Tongass um, kind of represents to many of us. Uh, so with that, um, having gotten through the questions. Uh, I just, want, again, wanted to say a huge thank you uh, to Amy, um, to Andy, to Kaden, to Ariel, to all of you who have supported the league, who have joined us um, over these past eight weeks, the, the response um, and interest and excitement for these webinars and for our speakers has just been overwhelming. And we're so grateful that we have such great partners like Amy and so many of the others that spoke to be able to bring you to these places uh, when many of us cannot go necessarily uh, somewhere else. So um, I hope you enjoyed uh, the last hour in the Tongass. Um, again, big thank you to everyone. And as always, please feel free to reach out um, with any questions to any of us. Thank you, Monica, for leading this internally for us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, thank, thanks everyone for tuning in. Yeah, thank you everybody. Yes, thank you. what a wonderful show.